Well, a couple minutes to review. We're in Philippians, of course, and Paul is in prison. He's writing this from Rome. So look at the very top of your outlines there. Our text in this message starts with a verse that is often misunderstood. Here's the phrase. It's chapter 2, verse 12. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I keep reading. We should all know that our works do not save us, but our works do point to the genuineness of our salvation. And we're, in fact, I want, to, I want to go to Matthew 7 and just read what Jesus said about this. Go to Matthew 7. Put your ribbon there in Philippians. We're obviously coming back there. Jesus used the analogy of the tree and the fruit to illustrate the very same truth. Matthew 7, 15. How many know the tree is known by its fruit, is it not? So let's read what Jesus says here. Matthew 7, verse 15. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles are they. Verse 17 is kind of the key verse here. So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That's judgment. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. How many know doing the will of the Father is bearing good fruit? Verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Not I knew you and you left. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So our memory verse is Matthew 7, 17. It was in the passage we just read. Read it out loud with me. So every good tree bears good fruit. But the bad tree, now don't look at the slide and say it again. So every good tree bears good fruit, but very good. See, you've already got it memorized. Well, in our text tonight, the opening verses emphasize the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of every believer, every believer. And that evidence is the fruit that is seen from our lives. And our text is going to be from verse 12 in chapter 2 all the way to the end of the chapter. But let's review for just about three minutes and let's read verses 5 through 11. Philippians 2, 5 through 11, just to kind of get the context as we move into our text. Verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or to be clung to, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. How many know he was in control of that, was he not? Verse 9, for this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, even those in hell, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So now let's keep reading. Look at verses 12 and 13. We begin our message tonight. Verse 12. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So look on your notes. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Some misinterpret these verses due to the opening statement, which we read, Work out your salvation. They see this as a self-help kind of Christianity. But the point is, now that you are already saved, here's the point, you're already saved because the Holy Spirit is in you. He's at work in you. Because of these things, you should strive to express the salvation in your conduct. Everybody say, work out your salvation. In other words, who you are on the inside should be evident on the outside. It doesn't say work for your salvation. Neither does it say work at your salvation. No one can work out his salvation unless God's already worked his salvation in them. This is the heart that's saved, that's tender to God's voice. The Spirit of God dwells inside that person. It simply means to be born again. So now keep reading. As believers, we respond to the work of the Holy Spirit. Once again, we have received this heart of flesh. It's a tender heart. It's not the hard-hearted heart of stone. Keep reading. God's word now illumines our path, and this should be seen in our conduct. 
So when we come to Christ in salvation, the Holy Spirit is in every single believer. And God's Word becomes real to us because of the new birth, and it enlightens our path. Can you say amen? If you're not in the Word every week, you should be, because you're really depriving yourself if you're not doing that as a believer. Psalm 119, 105, one verse. Read it out loud with me, please. Your Word is a lamp to my feet. Every time I read this verse, I think it means it shows me where I'm at, and it shows me where I need to go. It's a lamp to my feet. It shows me where I'm standing, but it's also a light to my path. Now go in this way. See, I'm glad that God directs us every step of the way. Now keep reading. As a follower of Jesus with this new heart and the Holy Spirit in us, we are to express God's character in all we do. And this was our verses that we read a minute ago. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now keep reading. To will and to work. God's working in us includes our will. And this next statement is very obvious. Willing comes before doing. As we read, he is in us to will and to work. Keep reading. Some would argue about free will, particularly before our salvation, but the truth is that God's work influences our will. If you chose to put your faith in Christ, guess what? He chose you before you chose to do that. Because you're not saved apart from his grace. You're not saved by human logic or human ability. It's God's ability, and he came to save people, listen, who are dead in transgressions and sins. You've got to be resurrected in a manner of speaking in order to even be born again. So keep reading. The heart of stone, that's the old hard heart, is removed, and the heart of flesh is put in its place. We now have a heart that is sensitive and tender. Ezekiel 36 speaks to this in these two verses. God is speaking here. He says, moreover, I will give you a new heart. Thank God for that. Put a new spirit within you. That's the Holy Spirit. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinance. Everybody say, thank God. God. I'm so glad that he saved sinners like you and me. Now, you may be able to go to the restaurant and order a cheeseburger with mustard, okay? But apart from the spirit of God, you do not have free will in anything that involves spiritual capabilities. It's what he does in us. So now if we just think for a minute, going all the way back to when Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit and fell, From that point on, all people are born with the same inability to choose Christ Jesus. Even Adam and Eve, after they ate the fruit, because when God came to the garden, they tried to hide from him. I mean, there's there's God's work of salvation with them. He called them and said, get over here. Caused them to repent, brought them forgiveness. I tell you what, it's all about God. But God, as far as we're concerned, he has chosen us. He saved us when we were dead in transgressions and sins. And now that we're saved, he lifts us up and he says, this is the way, now walk in it. Everybody say amen. Amen. Here's Augustine of Hippo. He died in 431. This is one of my favorite little statements. He said this, God command what you will and give what you, if he didn't give what he commands, we could never do the things that he directs us to do. But not only does he say go this way, he empowers us then to fulfill the very thing that he requires. So back on your notes. Here is the T. In the TULIP acronym, you know the acronym, Total Depravity, Unconditional Election, Limited Atonement, Irresistible Grace, Perseverance of the Saint. The T is total depravity. It's dead in transgressions. and You can't change your condition because you're already dead. Now keep reading. Apart from God's grace, we have no hope. Romans 3, 10 through 12. It's a quotation from the Psalms. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. Why do you seek for God? Because he came to you and brought that desire to you. All have turned aside. Together they've become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. But now let's look at John 1, 9 through 13. Look at these verses. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world and the world was made through him. The world did not know him. He came to his own. This is Israel. Those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born, get this now, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Whose will was it that caused us to be born again? was God's will. No, I made the decision. You made the decision because he changed your chooser. But when he changed your chooser, he made the decision that you're mine. 
And I'm so glad that he did, because apart from that, we wouldn't have a chance. Here's John 6, 41. Look at these verses. Therefore, the Jews were grumbling about Jesus because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. They were saying, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I've come down out of heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, do not grumble among yourselves. Now notice how Jesus says the same thing. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. That's the effectual call right there. Verse 45. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Put your hand on your heart. Say, thank you, Lord, for saving me. Because he did it, you didn't. And that's such a great thing for all of us. So now look back on your notes. If you have come to Christ Jesus, it is because God came to you in your spiritual death and blindness. God came to you in his amazing love. That's the word zoe in the Greek. Gave you eyes to see his truth. Gave you the faith to believe. And gave you eternal life. How many know he did it all, did he not? I tell you, that's why when we get to heaven, he's going to get all the glory. Put your ribbon there in Philippians and go back to the left to Ephesians 2. Go back one little book, just a couple pages to Ephesians chapter 2. Read the same thing that Paul writes to the believers in Ephesus. Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 10. I love this truth. I didn't know it growing up. I was raised Assembly of God. My dad was an Assembly of God pastor. We got saved by our will. But then again, we got saved every Sunday night because we knew we had sinned sometime during the week. So when I began to come into the understanding of these truths of the Scripture, it changed my life. I had no assurance of salvation, none. And yet as I began to see these things, it wasn't me that did this, it was God. That, the reason I'm His is because He brought me to Himself. Am I perfect? No. But you know what? I'm His forever. Because it's not my grip on Him, it's His grip on me. I love it the way... Jesus, I got you with my hand. The Father's got you in his hand. Who's going to take you from that place? Wow. Look at Ephesians 2, verse 1, and 1 through 10. Here we go. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's the devil, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, we were born this way, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. How many know, if you've got kids, they didn't have to be very old until they learned how to lie. We were born the same way. Verse 4, But God, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Where did saving faith come from? It came from God. It was a gift. Verse 9, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship that's a work of art. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Everybody say, I am predestined to spend eternity with God. And that's exactly the truth. So now go back to Philippians 2, and let's look at verses 14 through 16 as we work our way through the text here. Philippians 2, 14, 15, and 16. Verse 13, God's at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So verse 14, do all things without grumbling, Ooh, I got some work on that one, or disputing, so that, you will be, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. He's talking about them being in heaven and Paul's reward being in seeing them. But look on your notes. Philippians 2, 14 through 16. How can we live for God in this world? Well, we should begin by recognizing that the world, as we read in Ephesians, is dead in transgressions and sins 
without God and without hope in this world. So I've got two things on your notes. First, be submitted to God. You really think about it, and all of us have, have not done this in many times in our Christian walk, but it's pretty stupid when you just stop to think that I'm not, not going to submit to you, God. He just starts spanking you. I'm glad he perseveres with us, aren't you? First, be submitted to God. Follow his will without grumbling. Mm, look at your neighbor and say, I'm talking to you right now. Or complaining. The kind of reasoning that ends in grumbling or complaining actually is rebellion to God's will. God leads us every step of the way. Lots of examples. I didn't have room on your notes on this, but let me just give them to you quickly. Israel in the wilderness was led by Moses. Even before Moses brought them out of Egypt, listen, they grumbled because they were in Egypt. Then they complained after the deliverance from Egypt because they got tired of the manna which God provided. Then they grumbled for 40 years while they're in the wilderness, and then they get to the promised land, and they're still grumbling. Look at your neighbor and say, not me. A few of you didn't say that. Everybody say, not me. If it is you, you need to stop doing that. Keep reading. The proper attitude, on your notes, the proper attitude when God says we are to do something, we are to trust Him and obey Him who knows what is best for his children, read those two words out loud, without grumbling. And then keep reading on your notes. Then second, so first, be submitted to God. Second, we are to be blameless and innocent children of God as we see in verse 15, verses 14 and 15 there. This includes our honesty in business transactions. The Christian business person should be honest. It includes our taxes. We should be paying our taxes honestly. Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And it includes loving our neighbors. Here's one verse from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Just as God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. How are we holy and blameless? He gives us that, but that should be reflected in our character as we go through life. In fact, turn in your Bibles back to Matthew 5. Keep your ribbon there in Philippians. We're coming right back. Matthew 5. This is who we are, folks. Blameless and innocent children of God. Look at 5, 13. We'll read 13 through 16. Matthew 5, 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it become salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. As long as we're Christians, and that's our whole lives, we're the salt of the earth. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Now read verse 16 with me out loud if you've got your Bible open. Here we go. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That's blameless and innocent children of God in the world, and that should be evident in our lives. Now go back on your notes. Look at that next sentence. This process of being blameless and innocent and lights and salt should continue throughout our lives. Until the last day we're here when we go to be with Jesus in glory, that should be evident in our lives. Here's Psalm 139, just two verses, 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there be any hurtful way in me. Read, there, read the last line out loud. And lead me in the everlasting way. Here again is Philippians 2. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So go back to our text now, and let's read verses 17 through 24. Philippians 2, 17 through 24. He's going to talk about the two brethren here that we're going to talk about in closing. Philippians 2, 17. He says, But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, Paul knows that he's probably going to be executed, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way, and share your joy with me. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. Not Timothy, though. 
But you know of his proven worth, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately, as soon as I see how things go for me. Paul is still unsure about his, his future here. Verse 24. And I trust in the Lord that I myself also will be coming shortly. And of course, that did not happen. But look on your notes. Philippians 2, 17 through 24. Remember, we are in this, everybody say together. We are together in this, my friends. There may be times that we feel we are, that we feel, there may be times that we feel that we will never be fully conformed to Christ's image, such as his holiness, love, wisdom, etc. But we are to be like him. Once again, I want to quote Augustine. He said this, it's a repeat. God command what you will and give what you, I, we need to remember that when we're feeling weak and failing. Because God is still at work in us, and what He has started, He will finish. The Lord, repeat after me, say, The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. His mercy endures forever. He does not forsake the work of His hands. Now look at your neighbor, if you know him, and say, That's me. That's Christians are the work of His hands. So now look back at the next bullet point on your notes. When we begin to see our Lord's perfections and then see that we are to be like Him, <laughs> obviously requires supernatural resources. Aren't you glad God can do exactly what He's promised? Paul gives us three examples in closing here as we get to the end of the text. Talks about himself, talks about Timothy, who was a young minister at this time, and he talks about a layman named Epaphroditus. So in verse 17, look back in verse 17. He says, but even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you. Paul is saying in that verse that if he is martyred, that that's okay, it'll be like a drink offering offered to the Lord. Then he talks about Timothy in verse 19. Skip down to verse 19. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I, learn, when I learn of your condition, for I have no one else of kindred spirit. Most translations say I have no one else like him who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. Timothy was as faithful as Paul, and Timothy was concerned for others, a true under-shepherd. But our conclusion tonight is these last verses talking about Epaphroditus, a layman. So let's read verses 25 through 30, and then we'll go to our notes. Verse 25. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier. <laughs> they were quite close. Who is also your messenger and minister to my need because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him and not on him only, but also on me so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I have sent him all the more eagerly so that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less concerned about you. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. So now look on your notes, verses 25 through 30, conclusion. Epaphroditus, a layman. Number one, he is called a brother. That's in verse 25. Our brotherhood in Christ has nothing to do with age, education, or ethnicity. I'm so glad that Faith Community is a church that has many different nationalities and races. Every time I think about this, I think back to a song that we sang when I was a little kid. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious. And, and you know what? Skin color means nothing. It's all about the condition of the heart. Can you say amen? amen. God came to save people, all nationalities. And I tell you what, when we get to heaven, I don't know whether there's going to be colors and nationalities in heaven, but we're all going to be part of the same family. Everybody say, my brother. my brother. Then number two on your notes talks about Epaphroditus as a co-worker. It's in verse 25. There is much to be seen about our character by looking at the work that we do or that we don't do. That reveals character as well. In this day that we live, we need to keep our hand on the plow. No, that's not a verse of Scripture. I just pulled that up, okay? regarding our spiritual, everybody say job. You have a spiritual job, I have a spiritual job. And I listed some of my notes. Let me just read this. Not, it's not exhaustive by any means. Children's ministry, small groups, deacons, elders, greeters. And then we get to the one that applies to each one of us. Every believer is salt and light. And every believer 
is to be a witness wherever you are. That doesn't mean necessarily that you're preaching all the time, but it means that your life reflects the fact that you're a Christian. People should say to you occasionally, why are you like that? Boy, I tell you what, that's opening the door. Well, let me tell you why I'm like that. Can you say amen? amen? Our attitude and our love for one another, that's another thing that reflects the new birth in our hearts. So I don't like that brother. Well, you need to repent and learn how to like him. How many know that you should be reading your Bible every day? Amen. Say amen or oh me, because we should be reading our Bible. We should be spending time in prayer. I mean, that's all the life of the believer, and that's what keeps us moving in the right direction. It gives us strength on the inside. So what does this Christian work look like? I'm going to show you an example of this in Jesus at 12 years old. Go back to Luke chapter 2. Keep your ribbon in Philippians. We're almost done there, but go back to Luke 2. You know the story, but I'm going to read it for us. Luke 2, 41. Two forty one. Now, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. And when he became, did I say seven years old? Twelve, good. And when he became twelve, they went up there according to the custom of the feast. And as they were returning, after spending the full number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents were unaware of it, but supposed him to be in the caravan and went a day's journey. They began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Now, if that had been my parents, they would have been a little panicked. But when they found me, the panic would have turned to... Verse 46. Then, imagine this, parents. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When they saw him, they were astonished, Joseph and Mary. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. Now, they did not forget what happened when the shepherds were there and the angels were singing and all that before she conceived. But he said to them, to his mom and dad, to Joseph and Mary, Why is it that you were looking for me? <laughs> did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? A better translation about my father's business. Verse 50. But they did not understand the statement which he had made to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and continued in subjection to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Now, I know that he's the son of God, eternal. But what an example he gives us as to what our priority should be in life. Help us, Lord, to follow your example and to put the kingdom of God first. Everybody say amen. So let's start wrapping up here. Three areas in which we should work. And I put work in parentheses there. Or quotation marks. Number one, renew our minds to God's word. This should be one area of our work as long as we live. How many know we're supposed to be able to give an answer to the gospel when an opportunity presents itself? In fact, 1 Peter 3.15, look at this one verse. It says, but sanctify Christ. In other words, make it holy in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and... I don't know that your life, to a large degree, is the greatest testimony you have, greater than the words that you speak, because people see your life, they see your action, they see your attitudes, and that gives them evidence that what is going on with that guy? I know that guy, but... Why is he like that? And if there ever comes a presentation of a question, that's a wide open door for you to present the gospel. Can you say amen? amen? Number two, work in the social realm by reaching out and helping someone in the name of our Lord. Guess how the Salvation Army got started? Exactly that way. And then number three on your notes, work at evangelism. We need to be giving a witness. Can you say amen? amen. Matthew 5, 14 through 16, Jesus speaking to Christians you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. 
Let your light, let your witness, let your life, let your light so shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Everybody say, I can do that. Come on, everybody say, I can do that because the Holy Spirit lives in me. He does in every one of us. So every believer, every one of us in this room, we are a fellow soldier. That's what verse 25 says. Here's Paul's praise for his friend Epaphroditus. What was Paul thinking about when he wrote this? Obviously, he was aware of his coming execution. So look at the very bottom of your notes. We're almost done. Final thought. Paul's attention was on the needs of his fellow Christians, even though he knew his time of departure was near. Keep reading. Jesus lived serving others, fulfilling God's will. Paul lived serving others, fulfilling God's will. Timothy lived serving others, fulfilling God's will. Read that next one out loud with me. Let us also live in such a way as to glorify our Lord Jesus. Then Matthew 6, 33 and 34. Let's read these out loud. Read it with me. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself each day. Amen to that.